Science. Engineering. Medicine. Medicine. Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanity. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Science. Communication. Hello again, everyone. I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, we're tracking progress towards a malaria vaccine. Elsewhere, tackling depression through the active compound in magic mushrooms. And we have the Imperial Research Programme that's led to a groundbreaking approach to weight loss. Oh, it was life changing. I think I feel fitter now than when I was 17. I'm also way less than I did on my 17th birthday. But right from the first day on this, I never had any cravings. The Imperial College Podcast. All right, well, let's jump straight in, as we usually do, with a couple of news stories from around the college. Let's start with Al McCartney, who's with the Faculty of Medicine, and news of a joint medical school. So Imperial College must be part of this partnership, but others must be involved if it's a joint medical school of all things. So uh, who else is involved? Yep, that's right. So we at Imperial College London are working with the University of Cumbria, based up in Carlisle, on this new medical school, which was uh, given the green light in April by the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, It's going to be a little bit of time until it opens, but it's hoping to enrol its first cohort of graduate medical students in October 2025. Well, tell me about this new medical school. So, so this new school will be a, a, a true partnership between Imperial and the University of Cumbria. Imperial has one of the world's best medical schools, and the University of Cumbria has a fantastic reputation in training nurses, midwives and allied health professionals, and obviously know the region really, really well. So this is going to bring together the best bits of both organisations to develop this new medical school, and it'll be for uh, graduate entry. So this will be people who have already studied for a degree and want to move into medicine and the idea is that it will train generalist doctors who know the area can deal with the specific health requirements that the area needs and then stay in the area hopefully for the benefit of of Cumbria and the northwest of England. When will the school open? So this school over the next couple of years are going to be developing the curriculum and they hope to enrol the first cohort of graduate entry medical students in the autumn of 2025. Those students will uh, end up being based in University of Cumbria's new Citadel's campus. Um, so there's, there's a lot of investment in a, in a brand new state-of-the-art campus uh, in Carlisle, in Cumbria. Right, Al, thank you very much indeed for that. We'll follow that project with great interest as it progresses over the years ahead. That's Al McCartney. Well, now we have Conrad Duncan. And Conrad, a bit of a subject change here. We're going to talk about insect wings and some remarkable research where we're finding out in such incredible resolution about these particular insects and how their wings work and what we can learn from them. So um, just uh, tell me a bit more about this. Yes, uh, thanks, Gareth. So a team from Imperial led by Dr. Hao T. Lin from the Department of Bioengineering have been looking at uh, the wings of dragonflies and damselflies, and they've been studying how flying insects monitor the state of their wings in real time and respond to changes in airflow. And in doing so, they put together the most complete description of an insect wing sentry system uh, ever recorded. And it's incredible what they found, isn't it, in terms of just the complexity of what's going on in the wing. So what kind of things have they uncovered? So they looked at about 15 different species of dragonflies and damselfly, but particularly two were closely studied, the eastern amberwing dragonfly and the blue-footed dancer damselfly. And they found more than 3,000 wing sensors on the dragonflies and around about half that number on that species of damselfly. This was surprising for them. They've always known that mechanosensors were used on animal wings and insect wings, but they didn't know quite how many there were and the variety of these. And also a lot of energy is used for these sentry systems. So we assume that something important is going on and we need to find out what exactly they're, they're learning from this. Why is this so interesting for the researchers anyway? Well, there are three stages of the research. The first, which we've just had published, is looking at where the sensors are. This then lead, leads on to us looking at what the sensors are sending back to the animal, what they're picking up and what they're recording. And we hope to use this uh, in a third stage of research to apply directly to wing design. So to take the information we get from insect wing sensors and apply it to how we build wings on aircraft, but also on things like wind turbines and Formula One cars. All right. There you go. Thank you very much indeed for that. That's Conrad Duncan. Well, now, April the 25th, 
earlier this week marked World Malaria Day. One of those who wants to make malaria history is Professor Faith Ozier. Ultimately, she and her fellow researchers are aiming for an effective vaccine. Now, despite all the issues around COVID over the last couple of years, malaria research has been forging ahead, undeterred here at Imperial. Find out how via the excellent piece, Eight Innovative Ways Imperial is Tackling Malaria on Imperial Stories. Just go to imperial.ac.uk slash stories to read that thoroughly recommend it now haley has been speaking to faith ozia so why does the fight to end malaria mean so much to her i've seen the impact firsthand and there are images that will never leave me images of the impact that malaria has on a family when a child has died when a child has become disabled the impact that uh, I've seen when the clinics are jammed with people lining up for the whole day waiting to get a simple malaria test. So for me, I guess I feel the urgency of dealing with these problems because they've hit me close. And I think the closest comparison I can give is COVID. When we've had COVID hit Western countries, we've all felt it. We've all felt the pain of lockdown. We've all felt the pain of losing someone. We've all felt the pain of being ill ourselves. And so you feel that urgency for man. We need a vaccine and we needed it yesterday. Let's do it and let's throw everything that we can at it. For diseases that are far off, that sense of urgency is lost because it's, it's way over there. It doesn't really hit us. And so I think that for me, that burden that infection causes is very close. And I feel that, in fact, it's important for me to keep raising awareness that these problems are still there and they still have a major impact. And just because you don't feel them doesn't mean that they've gone away and that we still need to work on them. Getting that political will and that global determination to address a problem is so important. And that's why one of the things we can do is advocacy and really just say, Actually, these problems are solvable if people commit the sort of resources that are needed, then things would go a lot faster. So in malaria research, what is it that you study? What I've been studying is how people become immune to malaria. So if you come to a village out in the sticks in in Africa, where there's lots of mosquitoes and lots of malaria transmission, what you find is that... um, Adults are well. Mums and dads, older kids are all right. But younger kids who are living in exactly the same conditions, they get severe malaria and die. And so the burden is disproportionately high amongst infants and young children. But as people get older, they become increasingly resistant. And in adults, they just stop getting sick. They still get infected, but they don't get sick. So the body has learned how to do something. That says, you can bite me all you like, I don't care. I'm going to get on top of you. And it does exactly that. And that's what I've been trying to study for a long time um, and trying to understand which bits of the parasite are we responding to that actually help us to get rid of it and, and not to succumb to illness. So in the last five years, I uncovered a lot of mechanisms that seem to correlate with protection. So I'm going to continue to strengthen that um, and drive those mechanistic studies down to targets. So which individual antigens that I think are driving those kind of mechanisms that lead to parasite clearance. And that should lead me to a more effective malaria vaccine in the long run. I know your aim here is to make malaria history. But what will that take and how close are we? I, I'm a real believer in vaccines. With vaccines, we've eliminated some diseases like smallpox. Polio is almost completely gone. COVID, we're not looking like we'll eliminate yet. <laughs> but, you know, uh, vaccines just give us that hope that we can really get on top of a problem until it becomes relegated to history. The question of how long is always difficult to answer. Right now, we have a vaccine that's been licensed by the World Health Organization, but its efficacy is 30 to 40 percent. And if you reflect on uh, COVID vaccines that we've all had, the efficacy is over 90 percent. So it's nowhere near where we should be, and we need to do more. 
I think that with the technology that we have now, that progress should be faster, but it's always difficult to give it a precise time. You come to me after two years and say, hey, Faith, you said you'd be done in two years. Mm -hmm. Where are you? <laughs> and I won't be anywhere yet. Yeah. While you think about vaccines and saving lives, the impact is so much more. If you think about how COVID shut down the economy and people lost their businesses, restaurants and shops, everything closed down because of sickness. So once you can get rid of an illness, the downstream effects are so much more that uh, you save lives, but you also save livelihoods, you improve economy, you know, so much follows on from that. And so that's why I'm a big believer in vaccines. That in the end, if you can vaccinate and you have a really good vaccine that it just takes a shot and people can get on with life and living, that you've really gone a long way. And so that motivates me a lot. For malaria, people do other things. At Imperial, we do gene targeting, for example, where we try to modify mosquitoes. People use bed nets, people do insecticide spray, drugs. There are lots of things that people do. And I think that all these things are good. You'd better be doing something than doing nothing, you know? But I think for me, the game changer really would be a vaccine. Faith Ozier speaking to Hayley Dunning, and you can find out more via Imperial Stories. Well, now, the compound found in magic mushrooms alleviates depression better than conventional antidepressants. So say the combined results of two studies that have found the psychedelic compound psilocybin opens up depressed people's brains, even weeks after use. The story has been all over the media since the results were published recently in the journal Nature Medicine. This is a new analysis of brain scans from nearly 60 people receiving depression treatment, and it's been led by Imperial's Centre for psychedelic research. So do we now know for sure how psilocybin exerts its therapeutic effects on the brain? Ryan O'Hare has been speaking to Professor David Nutt, who heads the Centre for Psychedelic Research. Well, one of the things that's become very clear about depression is that people get locked into thought processes which they can't shake off. So typically depressed people think negative thoughts and they think negative thoughts about themselves and, and even though they know they're wrong, even though that generally they know that they're not to blame for the things they blame themselves for, they can't stop these thinking processes. We often call it tramline thinking. Your thoughts keep going on the same lines. You can't escape them. And a few years ago, when we first started doing brain imaging with psilocybin, we discovered that it, it had a powerful effect to increase connectivity in the brain during the trip. And we hypothesized that that was a, one of the factors that helped the drug worked, that it broke down this tramline thinking during the trip. And what's particularly interesting now about these two studies is that when we image people after the trip, in the first study, just a day after, in the second study, three weeks after, we find that the connectivity, increased connectivity persists. And it does predict the clinical outcome. So it does seem to have some relationship with the antidepressant effect generally. And that is actually very exciting because I mean, that's the first time we've had a, a, been able to show in patients that there is an enduring beneficial effect in the brain of the psychedelic treatment. And obviously um, psilocybin is, is, you know, a, a psychedelic effects, how we perceive things can cause hallucinations and whatnot. In the context of these trials, how much is down to the drug and how much is down to sort of the careful clinical setup and the psychological help that's available to people? Yeah, very important question. So just for the listeners to realise it, we always give the drug in a psychotherapeutic session, and that involves preparing people for the experience so they get the best out of it, being present with them during the trip so that they're reassured that they can get help if they need it. Normally they don't, but the trips are often challenging and they often go into dark places in their past, but the therapists are there if, in case they're needed. People are reassured. Afterwards, we do what's called integration. So the next day, and then several times subsequently, we help them talk through what the experience of the, of the trip and to try to make sense of what they learnt and how to use that knowledge to think differently about themselves. So get rid of those negative thoughts and think positively. Start seeing that, you know, that actually you can think positively about life because your brain has been changed by the psychedelic. So it's this powerful combination of the 
ability of the psychedelic to break down the old patterns of thinking and the psychotherapy to help you lay down new patterns of thinking, which we think is uh, why these are such powerful effects. But there's one other twist to this as well, which um, has become apparent in the last few years as we get what's called back translation. When we started publishing the work on brain imaging of psychedelics, uh, it was so unusual and so uh, powerful an effect that preclinical researchers went back and started asking the same questions. Does it happen in, in other species? And they can do much more invasive experiments there. And they showed a phenomenon called neuroplasticity. If you give psychedelics to, say, a rat, you'll find that it grows new neurons, and particularly it grows new synapses. To, it increases the connections in the brain. And that plasticity, we think, is a very important factor in learning new ways of thinking. And I think possibly also now in explaining why you get this increased connectivity, which lasts for at least, as I say, three weeks. Where does this study and this new work leave us in terms of psilocybin as a treatment? When will it be available for people or will it be available for people? Well, I hope it will be available. When uh, The first study we did, which was an MRC funded study and was published in 2016. I mean, since then, over 40, four zero companies, small pharmaceutical companies have been set up to try to develop psilocybin and other psychedelics as a treatment for depression. So it's actually spawned an enormous industry. There's a lot of interest, and the, the good news is that the, one of the first ones on the scene was a company called Compass Pathways, and they replicated our first study, which was a single dose of psilocybin in people with resistant depression, and they found very similar results to us, but in a much larger group. So it does seem as if this phenomenon of the antidepressant effect of psilocybin can be shown in these big clinical trials, which you need for registration and regulation. So... Having achieved that goal, which is not trivial, the fact that that worked is very encouraging. I think it's very, very likely that psychedelics, at least psilocybin, will be a medicine for depression within the next four years. David Nutt, and he's speaking there to Ryan O'Hare. Well, finally, if you're looking for some gripping springtime reading that could also help you lose weight, look no further than the book The Full Diet, The Revolutionary New Way to Achieve Lasting Weight Loss by Imperial's Dr. Syra Hamid. She's in our Department of Metabolism, Digestion and Reproduction and is also a consultant in endocrinology and diabetes at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. The book, a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller is based on Cyrus' landmark Imperial SatPro weight management program. Now, one of those going through it is Jill, a patient who met Syra through taking part in an Imperial gut hormone study. And as you'll hear, the results for Jill have been dramatic and life changing. First, though, Syra began by telling Maxine Myers that it's all about sharing the latest scientific research with patients. We ran this as a research protocol at Imperial for a year and our patients lost 14% of their body weight, which is the sort of weight loss you expect after gastric band surgery. People reversed their diabetes, people came off blood pressure tablets, people gave their sleep apnea machine back to the hospital. So these were the sorts of health outcomes which in more traditional diet or lifestyle change programs we just weren't seeing. This is incredibly exciting. Our patients attend for 14 sessions as a group. And every time they come, they learn something new. It might be about food or hormones or genes or sleep or behavior. And the chapters in my book mirror those sessions pretty closely. So the point of the book and why I decided to write the book is that we can reach so many more people than we could ever see in our clinic. Just can you briefly just tell me, for those who don't know, but talk me through the SAPRO program and why is it so unique? Yeah, so... Firstly, when we eat something, there can be a rise in the amount of sugar in the blood. And that's particularly true when we eat carbohydrate heavy foods like bread and rice and pasta and biscuits. That sugar has to go somewhere. It cannot disappear by magic. So insulin will push that excess sugar into body fat and we gain weight. The magic, as it were, of the SAPRO program is that the amount of insulin that we are producing, which is this fat storage hormone, can be modulated by our food choices. So if we're eating a less sugar rich diet, if we're basing our meals more on proteins and and fats and vegetables and and so on, keeping that blood sugar level nice and stable. When you're having cereal for breakfast and sandwiches for lunch and pasta for dinner, you can see now that you will be in fat storage mode quite a lot of the time. So changing your hormones like that is a pretty nifty part of the program. What else? When you eat, 
your gut produces fullness hormones. They tell your brain you're full, you can stop. But if we eat certain foods, that fullness signal is much stronger. So how about turning up that fullness signal by changing the foods that we eat? Which is why you can have an omelette and enjoy it and move on with your day. Whereas if you have a couple of pieces of toast for breakfast, very often you might be hungry 90 minutes later. You're not tapping into those fullness hormones as effectively. So it's these sorts of things that the programme is based on. Also, many people come to our clinic and they say things like, I'm worried it's all my genes and I can never lose weight. You know, it's my genes. So we talk about things like how do your genes affect your weight? Because they do. What does sleep do with your weight? Huge body of evidence. So telling people why sleep is important and about a third of the program is absolutely to do with mindset shift and, and kind of really wiring in those behaviours and building that sort of self-compassion that makes you think I'm worth it. Actually, it's worth me investing in myself to, to do these things so that my health improves. Yeah, um, it's really, really holistic way of looking at it. Jill, um, it would be great to bring you in. Like, what did you have to do as part of it? Well, it's really, it's a complete change in what you're eating, really. All the things that the food industry told me that were good for me were bad. Like, I, well, I admit to it now, I had three cans of Diet Coke every day and I thought that was doing myself good. And I couldn't count calories because I tried to... St- I, I don't think I ever ate more than about fifteen, sixteen hundred 1,600 calories a day, but I don't think I even managed to keep my weight stable at that. And was it more as well just being able to have in a community of people that you're part of this journey with? So was there opportunities to not just learn about the food and what you're putting into your body, but were there other aspects to it? Like what were some of the main lessons that you learned? I think some of the things were really, were quite a, a revelation really. I think the one about sleep was a revelation because the only time I ever lost weight was when I was pregnant and then I put the weight back on when I was breastfeeding. And I thought, you're supposed to lose weight when you're breastfeeding, but then, of course, you're not sleeping. Also, some of the psychological ones were quite amazing, like there was one called What's the Gain, when you sort of deal with what you're doing to yourself and why you're doing it to yourself and why you're in a self-sabotage. And that was quite a revelation. What has it been like for you, just in general, coming out of the other side of the programme and now, you know, living your life? It was life-changing, and I think I feel fitter now than when I was 17. I'm also way less than I did on my 17th birthday, and that's for certain. And that, and in a way, it's a tragedy. I couldn't stick to the, any conventional diet because I had terrible cravings. But right from the first day on this, I never had any cravings. And so for you, like hearing those sort of testimonies, what are the, some of the messages that you want people to really take away from? I'd really love people to read the book with a sense of optimism. Jill is a, a real-life person. And she's achieved those outcomes. And so there's no reason really why other people cannot, you know, do the same. We know this because it's a real life clinical service that we deliver in our NHS clinic every day. I hope people feel that real life people like Jill have done this, are doing this, so I can do it too. Let's move on from the things that didn't work before and let's feel a sense of hope and optimism. An optimistic note there from Syra Hamid. We also heard from Jill. Both were speaking to Maxine Myers. The Full Diet is published by Michael Joseph and it's out now. Well, there you go. That'll do for this edition. Let's uh, leave with the usual reminders about where you can find us. It'll be on a podcast platform of your choice. Let's see now. We're on iTunes, Spotify, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud. We're probably somewhere else as well. Everywhere, basically. But it's always worth giving you that little reminder. Well, I'm Gareth Mitchell saying thank you very much indeed for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.